Hey friends, and welcome to the long awaited, long promised Ask Me Anything video. Um, I asked you all for questions um, probably close to a month ago now and um, took those and a bunch of the questions that you had left in comments on past videos and put them all together. And there were a couple of categories of questions um, like why is it taking me so long to learn to draw questions and why is it taking me so long to get clients questions that we're going to answer in future videos <laughs> that are going to come soon. Um, and I decided to do those separately because they were like pretty in depth and I had a lot that I wanted to say about those things. And also because so many of you asked those questions, those are by far the most common um, in this batch and not just in this batch, but like ever. So these are all the questions that did not fall into those categories. And some of them are serious and some of them are fun and silly. And we're just going to go ahead and dive in. Um, and oh, before I do that, <laughs> thank you to everybody who sent in a question, um, who trusted me with your questions. I appreciate it. I read every single one and there are, um, there were, there were enough repeats as well that most of these I've just kind of, if there were repeats, I merged them. Um, and I took names off of and all of that, but thank you to everybody who sent them in. I read every single one and I am answering them now, even if you don't hear your exact wording or your name. Um, all right. So first question is, how did you work out what kind of commissions to offer and how did you know what people would buy? So um, I've talked about this before uh, on this channel, but I didn't like pretty much everything that I did in the early years when it came to uh, making art, I was focused on making art as a method of survival. <laughs> I was focused on making art because I was stuck by myself at home, uh, sick, and I was really depressed when I wasn't doing anything. So um, for me, making art and putting it online, I wasn't like initially aiming at that target of wanting to have people buy it or to offer commissions. So I first was just making the work that I wanted to make. And then I had people start reaching out to me saying, you should sell prints. And that was probably about like six months in. And so I, that was what prompted me to get a scanner because I had no idea how to scan anything. And so I got a scanner and I was figuring out how to do that, how to make prints. And, um, and that was just, like the work that I had already made, making prints of those. And uh, and I never, to be honest, I never like set out and thought like, let me do commissions. I just had people start asking, you know, could you draw this food for me or that food? Initially it was mostly food. And then I started getting more commissions to do portraits after I started drawing people again. Um, so it, it was all coming directly out of what I was drawing on my own, what I liked drawing, and people would commission me to do those kinds of things. Now, that being said, I think it's happened three times. I went back and actually <laughs> counted. I think it's happened three times that I got commissions to draw things that I never ever drew. And all three times they were houses <laughs> and uh, house portraits. And I, I never did houses. I never painted houses. I never did house portraits on my own. People just asked me to do house portraits. And so I did that three times but I never advertised that. I never put those up anywhere because I didn't actually, I apologize for the noise. There's some work going on on the roof outside the studio. Um, and we're just going to record this today because this is actually my third time recording this video. Uh, I feel like that's what I say every time recently, but I had, um, I had recorded the last time I recorded, the mic stopped working. So anyway, we are just going to chug right along, even though there's somebody banging on the roof. Uh, yeah, so I didn't ever advertise those because I didn't want to keep doing them. Now, um, the second part of the question, how did you know what people would buy? Obviously I didn't, but if you were asking present Kendall, <laughs> um, what I would suggest around this is offering things that people can make personal. So, you know, even if you look at what people did buy from me, like food, it was, they were commissioning food that was sentimental to them or that meant something to them. When they commissioned portraits, it was somebody that they loved or, you know, uh, several times people commissioned the portrait of themselves so that they could give it to somebody else. Um, even the houses, that's really personal. People who are having me paint their houses or, you know, one person had me paint this cabin that her family always traveled to uh, in the summertime they didn't own it, but it was just this really special place for them. Um, so yeah, thinking about like, what is something that people would actually want a picture of that would go in their house. And those categories, I think portraits, like personal, uh, places or like 
very personal objects and food, those kinds of things, those would all be kind of top categories for what I would imagine for, for commissions in terms of just like what regular people would buy. Um, I don't do commissions myself anymore. I only do commercial work. Um, We'd have a whole other video about why that is, but um, that's where I would start if I were doing commissions today. Uh, next question is, are you comfortable drawing on regular tables rather than tilt tables? Uh, and I have drawn on a tilt table. Um, I have a drafting table actually back behind me there, and that's what I used to always draw, my old white table. <laughs> and now I have my new white tables, and my new white tables are just regular flat tables. And that's because even though I had a tilt table for years, I never used it. I never used the drafting table function because I um, am always using lots of different well, there's two reasons. I'm always using a lot of different pencils and they will like roll all around. And so I have to have some other flat surface, which is kind of a pain. Um, I also do a lot of watercolor and watercolor can be kind of drippy. Um, and I sometimes will do wet on wet techniques. So it just always made more sense for me to be bending over. Uh, and that is kind of not great for my posture, <laughs> but I do yoga and I exercise and I try to do what I can. And um, yeah, that's just kind of what it is. If I am painting like that kind of a painting where I'm using acrylic or, you know, back when I used to do oil painting, I do actually really like to be upright, especially if you're doing something really big. I mean, that, what's that? That's like, I think that's a 18 by 24 maybe or 16 by 24. Um, so if you're doing a bigger painting, then for sure I would want to be upright. But most of what I do is, is under that size anyway. So being flat on the surface, I don't end up with too much distortion. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it works okay. <laughs> uh, next question, why is it taboo to talk about having kids if you're a commercial illustrator? So um, I think this, this was a question that was on a different video, a video where I had talked about how I felt kind of anxious when I was pregnant with Penelope about what I was going to communicate to different clients and art directors that I worked with. And um, that's so it's not to say that it's taboo to have children <laughs> if you're an illustrator there are plenty of illustrators and artists with children but i think that there is kind of a uh if not an assumption at least like a very frequently told narrative that especially for women once you have children you are no longer as invested in your career or serious about your career because you know all you care about is having kids, being with your kids, and you know, you, you don't have that priority for, for your job anymore. And um, I think that that's true regardless of what industry you're in. I think that's true just kind of in the world that we live in. Um, but the way that ends up colliding with commercial illustration or really any kind of freelance work is, you know, the, the fact that you don't have an actual job to go back to. It's not like, you know, if you take six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks of maternity leave or, or any kind of parental leave, um, you don't have like, okay, now I'm going to go back to my teaching job. I'm taking my time off and I'm going to go back to my teaching job and my teaching job will be there for me. You, you work with clients and the clients, you know, hopefully you build up having regular clients, but also a lot of the time clients come and go. And, you know, if they ask you, my fear, it was if like, I got a lot of inquiries when I was, out for maternity leave, if I was out for a really long time, basically that people would stop asking and that people would stop seeing me as a serious um, artist or a serious, somebody who is serious in the industry. <laughs> and um, to be very honest, I, I don't think I've ever talked about this before, but to be very honest, I, at the time, I didn't even tell any art directors. I didn't even tell um, any of the people that I worked with regularly, I didn't tell them that I was pregnant and I didn't tell them that I was having a baby. Of course, if they had gone on YouTube, they could have seen that, but most art directors that I work with don't actually look at my social media. Um, so, uh, yeah, what, what, at the time I said something like, you know, I, I think I took eight weeks and I was very intentional taking less time, um, that I was going to be completely unplugged. You know, I, not that I just like went back full speed or whatever, but those eight weeks I was going to be completely unplugged. And, um, and I said something like, you know, for personal health reasons, <laughs> I think that was what I said. And, um, yeah, I, I think I feel 
I don't have great feelings about that. I wish I could have been more honest. I wish I could have just been like, this is what's happening. And maybe I could have, and it would have been totally fine. Um, but I have since then tried to be very honest about the fact that, yes, I have kids, I'm a mom. Um, and the way that I do it, because I will, another very common question is like, how do you do it? How can you be a mom and an illustrator? And I don't have any magical solution other than that I have childcare. And I've tried to be like very frank about all of that since probably since Penny was like six months old. That's when I started to feel more comfortable sharing it online and um, or sharing it with people that I worked with regularly that I that I was a mom and that this was, you know, a part of my life now and that I, I also, I think, just for myself was a little bit afraid that once I had her, I was going to suddenly magically like not want to paint anymore <laughs> and that I was going to stop like having any kind of work ambitions because all I would want to do is just be with my child. And, um, and then I felt when that didn't happen, when I had her and I absolutely adored her, um, but also, you know, was having a super hard time with nursing and not sleeping at all. And just the adjustment to motherhood was, was very challenging for me. And I was without the thing that I realized then was my stress relief, which was painting. And even if I was painting for clients, that's the time when that like stressed out, anxious part of my brain turns off. So um, I think I, yeah, I had my own like very complicated, obviously I'm answering this question in such a long way. I had my own very complicated mixed feelings about that. I should probably just make a whole other video on that topic, but um, yeah, so it's not taboo to talk about having kids. It's not taboo to have kids, but it was something that I felt a lot of anxiety about. And, um, now, uh, after, you know, four, almost five years, Penelope is going to be five in two months, which I can't believe. Um, I can confidently say that it's, it's been fine. It has not negatively impacted my career. Um, and I adore my children and I also still really love to draw and paint and I still want to, do this job. I still want to do this work. So um, let me know if you guys have other questions about that. If you want to see another video about the topic or if you have specific questions, um, leave those in the comments. Um, next question, do you store your art in portfolios or in individual sleeves? And what about larger pieces? So I do use you can see them behind me there, like at the bottom of that shelf, those little black things in the corner. I do use the Etoya um, portfolios and they each page is like a two sided sleeve acid free and they have like a little divider paper in there and you can get them I don't know what the smallest size is but you can get them up to like very large sizes and I do I have 9 by 12s 11 by 15s and 12 by 18s and that covers most of my needs since most of what I do is smaller than that but I have a few pieces that are slightly larger or sometimes I'll have a piece that's like 12 and a quarter by 18 inches because I didn't cut the paper the right size and for those I just put them in my flat file drawers and we'll put like pieces of paper um, in between them. Uh, next question, what are your thoughts about light fastness and pigments for original art? Is this something that we should worry about or pay attention to? Um, so this is quite a topic in the dry media community. I don't think it's as much of a thing in like oil or acrylic painting, but um, in like pastels and colored pencils, they're there is a pretty wide range of um, of light fastness. And what that means is that, you know, a, a pigment that is exposed to UV light over the long term could potentially fade or change. Um, now, the way that they test this is that they, like, will put these, lay these pigments down, lay these, um, these media down on a paper or some kind of substrate and then cover up half of them and then put them out in the direct sun uh, or that's the way that a lot of a lot of artists will test them and then you you know leave it out there for some number of days and then come back and check now my response to that is if you are leaving your artwork out on a picnic table in full direct sunlight for days on end you should not be owning original artwork <laughs> And I don't know any people who own original artwork who would do that. Now, a scenario that is more common is that somebody might, you know, frame their piece and hang it somewhere in their house that gets some amount of, of direct sunlight for some portion of the day. So um, the way that I deal with that is I tell everybody who buys an original that they need to be kept out of direct sunlight. And that will be true 
that's true for any piece of art. It doesn't matter what it is. Like it should be kept out of direct sunlight. Art, original art should not go in direct sunlight, period. End of story. <laughs> um, the other thing you can do, and I often recommend, is having the piece behind UV light. And um, this is not expensive to do. You can just buy like, uh, or sorry, behind UV glass. Um, you can just buy like an off the shelf frame from Michaels or AC Moore or wherever you get your frame and, um, and then bring it up to the custom framing area and they will cut a piece of glass for you. It'll be like, I think in the like $20 range, depending on how big it is. If it's a smaller piece, it'll be even less. But, um, the last time I did it, it's not, it's not like it's hundreds of dollars or something. You get the inexpensive frame and then you can go up and have them cut the UV glass and, um, and then they'll put it in there for you. You'll be good to go. So you can probably guess by the way I have started my answer to this, that this isn't something that I put a ton of stock in. I, I think there are a lot of, you know, the, a, a big, if you are really in the nitty gritty of this debate or this question, you will know Prismacolor is some, is a brand that gets kind of, uh, some hate, some heat rather <laughs> for not having all of their colors be perfectly light fast while something like, um, Coran Ash Luminance or the Derwent light fast, um, have like much higher light fastness ratings across the whole range, but they are also more expensive than Prismacolor. Um, so that's kind of like the very specific end of it. But um, there are tons of, prof well, sh I shouldn't say tons because there aren't tons of professional colored pencil artists, but there are plenty of professional colored pencil artists, myself included, who use Prismacolor. I also use Coranda Ash and I also use Holbein. Um, haven't ever really gotten into Derwent because I don't love the feel, but um, yeah, I, I use a range and for me, if I if I tell people not to put them in sunlight and I suggest that they put them behind UV glass, like I think that, that that's the same advice that I would give to somebody even if they were buying an oil painting that didn't have those same issues. Um, so yeah, my view is it's not that big of a deal. So um, yeah, take those precautions and don't put your, don't put your art out on a picnic table in the full sun. Thank you. <laughs> Next question. Um, all right. How long did it take you to learn to draw? Um, this is a tough one to answer because um, I uh, I drew sporadically uh, throughout childhood and adolescence. I never was one of those people. Oh my gosh. I never was one of those people who would just like sit down and go for hours and hours, day after day after day. I would have like a period where... I would draw and paint a lot and then I would stop. Um, and then in college, I didn't take an art class until the second semester of my sophomore year. Um, and then at that point I changed my major and, and enrolled as a painting major. Um, and um, then I did start putting in some serious time and I, I don't know how many hours, but it was a lot of hours every week for, you know, a couple of years and um, some classes more intensively so than others. And I would say I started to see like a pretty big jump in terms of the improvement of my actual skill and my actual ability to, to draw and paint pretty quickly, like within a year. Um, because I had never really put in serious time before. But then when I graduated, I've talked about this in a lot of videos too, I, I stopped making art for like four years for a lot of different reasons. And if you wanna see all the reasons, you can watch my art autobiography video. It talks about like all of the reasons why I quit making art and why I started making art again. Um, but one of the things that was really critical, one of the reasons why I quit was that I didn't know how I didn't have any kind of art making process that I enjoyed engaging in. I um, knew how to fulfill assignments and I had some very specific skills, but I really struggled with motivation and I, I, yeah, I just stopped making art for quite a long time. So then there was this huge gap. So I had, you know, a couple years of working on it, then huge gap of four years. And then when I started drawing again and got into it like pretty intensely, like probably drawing even more than I did when I was in school for hours and hours every single day, um, then I think it was about a year after that, <laughs> that I started to feel like I had I was better with motivation. I was better with finishing pieces, like pretty consistently finishing pieces. And I had a, uh, I definitely had a style, like a, a, an observable style that somebody else would recognize. Um, so I don't know, like three, three years, 
I think plenty of people do it a lot quicker than that and there are plenty of people that take a lot longer. So if you are one of those people that has emailed me about, uh, emailed me or messaged me about like why it's taking you so long to learn to draw, um, that's a little sneak peek of what we'll talk about. Um, but it, uh, it takes a long time and it's normal for it to take a long time. And the people who are promising you that it can be done in you know, a week or two weeks or a month or 10 minutes a day, they're not telling the truth. So um, it, it's normal for it to take a while there's there's pretty big variability some people are going to be faster than three years but you know obviously that's how long it took me and I'm still here still drawing and, and doing it full time so um, next question how do artists get health insurance so um, this is a tough one if you if you live in the US um, you know that this is like a very very real question and a very real struggle for people who are self-employed, um, not just for artists, for anybody who's self-employed. So um, this is another thing that I've tried to always be pretty frank about um, is, is acknowledging the privilege that I've had in terms of having a, a partner who has a job that has health insurance. And um, so that has been there for, for me really since the beginning, because we got married like pretty young. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's not been something that I've ever had to like really dig into in terms of like buying health care, health insurance on the exchange. Um, but I know that a lot of artists do and that a lot of self-employed people that that's how they have to do it. They have to buy it on the, on the open market. So I have often thought to myself because I, I do have one of those brains that just thinks about death sometimes. <laughs> and, um, and I have thought if, if, um, God forbid, if my partner, if anything ever happened to him, um, I have thought like, maybe I would just have to move to Canada or see if I could move to Europe or something because with the health history that I've had, it would be really hard for me to buy um, health insurance on an open market. So um, I'm grateful that I haven't had to at this point. Um, but yeah, I think that that's how most people do it. So um one other thought I did have, if I ever am in that boat, I know that it that health insurance premiums cost very pretty wildly from state to state. So if I couldn't move out of the country or didn't want to move out of the country and I had to get my own health insurance, I probably would um, look at like which states had lower health insurance premiums while also still having good coverage and you know ideally a lower cost of living as well. So um, next question. What do you find easy to draw and what do you find difficult and have you identified what makes it easy or hard? Um, so I think in the beginning I was much more attuned to this and feeling like, oh wow, this is a hard thing to draw or this is an easier thing to draw. And usually that would have to do with complexity or whether it was the face. So um, I think it, early on I always felt like drawing people is the hardest thing because we are that's the thing that we all look at the most. We spend time looking at ourselves in the mirror. We look at pictures of each other. Even if you are not really like naturally gifted with proportions or somebody who knows a lot about proportions, chances are if you see a drawing of the human face and there's something off about it, most people will be able to see. They may not be able to say, well, the nose is too high up, but they'll know that something looks off. So I always felt like that made the human face inherently more difficult to draw than say like, I don't know, a cat, <laughs> because we're not quite as attuned to those proportions as we are to the proportions of the human face. Um, so some combination of like that, and then, you know, things that were more complex, like I remember like really having, really struggling with very technical illustrations, um, technical drawings, like things that were man-made, like tools and stuff. Um, you have to do a lot of that in art school, and, or at least I did. I feel like those were the harder things to draw. Um, now, I, looking back, I think I would answer that differently. I would say the hard things to draw are the things that I don't enjoy drawing. <laughs> and that can sometimes be like a chicken and egg situation because if something's a little bit easier, you may enjoy doing it more because it may, you know, not, you may not be like, quite as keyed in to your, or your inner critic may not be quite as keyed up as it is if you're drawing something that's really challenging. Um, so in general, I would say the, I think that the thing that makes it easier, hard is how much, yeah, how much you enjoy that particular thing that you're drawing, because if you enjoy it, then, um, you can get into that phase that, um, that other level of like, where you're kind of in the flow state <laughs> and that the flow state makes 
anything feel enjoyable or makes it feel easier. It makes it, you know, if you think about spending seven hours sitting down working on one drawing, for a lot of people that will feel intimidating or that will feel like, oh gosh, I don't think I could do that. I don't have the attention or whatever. And I do that all the time. And I don't do that because I'm like amazing at paying attention. Um, I struggle with attention in a lot of situations actually. Um, but I am really um, tuned in to that process and I love that process and when I'm doing it those seven hours fly by I sometimes will forget to eat or drink because I'm so engaged in what I'm doing and to that extent it, it feels easy in a way it, it feels um transcendent that's the best word it feels transcendent <laughs> so um yeah i think finding if you're at the very beginning and you're asking yourself this question trying to really pay attention to whenever that happens even if it happens just for a little while if you're like working on a piece and suddenly 30 minutes goes by and you realize oh wow i've just been so into this pay attention to that notice when that happens i think um that's not the same thing as easy but if you can find that process predictably it will make everything else easier because now I can turn that process kind of off and on almost like it's not that it happens every single time and if I'm drawing something I've never done before and that is really new and I'm out of my comfort zone and I'm feeling self-conscious I probably will not get there I probably will feel like well this is hard and my inner critic is way more uh, way more present way louder in those situations but um I could draw some, like I could draw tools now and I would get to the flow state and I, that never would have happened to me before. I can do the portraits. I can, it really, it, it's something that is a muscle that has grown and it grew because I gave it a chance to grow <laughs> because I focused on those things um, where that was present. And, and even though at the time I was like, oh, I wish I could be doing something serious, like, you know, drawing people, um, that wasn't, I wasn't motivated to do that. I didn't like doing it. The thing I liked doing was drawing food. So I focused, start on that. I, I started and focused on that. And then that made space to focus on these other things. So hopefully that's a, a helpful answer or something that you can apply um, to wherever it is that you're at, the thing that you're struggling with. Um, next question. How do you clean your painting table? Um, I'm worried that using soap will leave chemicals that are bad for the paper. Um, I use Mr. Clean Magic Erasers and uh, I will cut them into smaller pieces and just use like a little piece and use that several times to clean the table. It's awesome for getting watercolor off. It gets colored pencil off. I don't think it would get something like Sharpie off. If you had to do that, you'd have to use alcohol, but um, but yeah, it's great. And I just use that and water um, for the same reason. I don't want any like solvents uh, on the table that could potentially hurt the paper. Uh, next question. How do you balance giving yourself the time you need to create quality art while not losing your audience on social media in the meantime? And how do you push through the fear of getting left behind if you don't rush it? Um, <laughs> this is a struggle. Yeah, but this is a struggle and something that I definitely feel. Um, I think I, I feel it maybe a little bit less now than I did a year ago and a little bit even more, even less than the year before that. I, I think it is something that has like a downward trend, which I'm grateful for. Um, because initially when I got started, um, when I was in that phase of just like painting, making stuff for fun, because I was trying to motivate myself, I was putting new stuff out there every day. And I was just like a constant content engine. <laughs> I would never have said that at the time because I didn't, I don't think I even knew the word. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, I, I was prolific and I felt like I had to keep that pace up and I even have felt like that with YouTube. I, you, you guys know if you're a regular watcher of this channel, going through a lot of growing pains with the channel and trying to figure out how I can keep that up and keep making videos while also having a different pace in uh, the type of content that I'm able to produce because of doing more client work. So I feel like um, having having more and more client work over the years and as the years have gone by you know initially it was just like all me making whatever I wanted to make and putting it out there and then it started to be like some other client work alongside that and and that 
work that I was making kind of kept on the same trajectory. I was still making the same amount of stuff. I was still putting new content out there, um, new, I, I hate using that word, but I was still putting new stuff out there, new videos, new artwork, doing, doing something pretty regularly that was self-initiated, putting it out there right along with making the client work. And that was because the client work would come in fits and starts. You know, I'd have a couple weeks where there was a lot of it and then I'd have, you know, a month where there was nothing. And um, that really let me like batch things together and I would make a ton of personal work in the time that I wasn't working on client work. So I was able to keep that up for several years. And then I think around like 20, 2019 was like the turning point for when I just couldn't keep that up anymore. And I had to start finally saying like, okay, I'm, I'm busy enough that I, I can't, I just don't, I'm not making the same level of personal work that I was at one point and that's okay. And I feel like hand in hand with that lesson has been the lesson about social media <laughs> because I, um, the, the pressure, what I felt is pressure to make more personal work was also just pressure to be putting stuff out there and to, to be a content engine, to be somebody who was like constantly making new stuff for people to consume. And I had to reach a point of being like, this is not, yeah, this is not sustainable because I'm doing all this client work and I, I can't, yeah, I just can't keep both of them up. And, um, because of that, I think having the pressure from like, oh, I'm doing client, I'm doing client work. That's why I have to not do as much of this. It did make it a little bit easier than I think if you're, if you're just, you know, if you're still in that early phase and you're trying to like build up, build stuff up and put stuff out there on social media and you're feeling that pressure to put something out every day. Um, and there's no other counterbalancing pressure coming saying like, no, you have to do client work. Um, I think that probably is a harder situation and it's one that I haven't been in. Um, but I can say from my perspective, pushing through the fear of getting behind, if you're not like constantly putting stuff out there, um, I don't have a magical solution to that. I don't have anything I can say, this is a trick that I've done that's worked for me. Um, I will say I tend to have a freak out about this uh, probably at least once a year, maybe a couple times a year. And um, some of my friends and definitely Eric could tell you that, yeah, that's something I'll just get really hung up on periodically. And then I end up deciding not to pay attention to it. Not that it's not real, not that it's not there, but it's kind of like any other fear-based thought, any other um, mind rut that you get in there that I get in. And I tend to be somebody who gets in a lot of mind ruts and I can recognize after a little while, oh, my brain is just on this loop. I'm just having this thought. I'm afraid that if I don't put enough stuff out there, I'm not going to grow or nobody's going to pay attention to me or I'm going to become irrelevant or whatever it is. Um, and I'll spend some time stuck on that. And then after a little while, I'll kind of become aware, oh, I'm stuck on that. And um, there's not really anything I can do one way or another to change that. So I guess I'm just going to keep doing what I was doing. And um, that, that tends to be my approach for really anything that is causing me fear or anxiety. If I can point something out that I can do concretely that's different, then I will do it. But in this situation, I, ca I can't really. And even if you are somebody who has the flexibility to just solely be making self-initiated work and you're feeling like that, that intense pressure to put stuff out there every day, um, um, that's not going to go away. Even if you, even if you do that, even if you, even if you feed that monster, that monster's not going to stop being scary. You're still going to feel that pressure. So I, I, I did that for a number of years and I still, I still felt that intensity. I never felt like I did enough. And once you accept that there is at least if you're like me, I should say, once I can accept that there's nothing I can do to make that feeling go away, even if I do what the feeling tells me to do, it's a lot easier. It's a lot, it becomes a lot easier for me to just say, all right, well, I guess I'm just going to do what I want to do anyway. I think as a, as a artist and I guess even just like as a human being, I don't want to make my decisions based off of what I'm afraid of or things that I'm afraid might happen. I want to make my decisions based off of what is important to me and the way that I want my life to look in the future. So um, if you can, if you can recognize when you're getting into that mind rut where you're, you know, feeling all the fear about social media and getting left behind and needing to do all these things to keep up with it and realizing that even if you did all those things, it would not make a difference. <laughs> if you can 
have the uh, the presence of mind, if you can transcend that for a moment and, and realize what's actually happening to you, take a step back and think about like, what do you actually want your creative practice to look like in right now, in a few months, in a year, and make your decisions based off of that. So um, that was the last serious question. <laughs> and now, uh, thank you, my heartfelt thank you to the two people who asked me questions about pie. Um, I think it did, doing an ask me anything, I was like, oh man, I'll get questions besides stuff that's about art, but you know, pretty much everything was about art, which is totally fine. I could obviously talk about that all day. We've been here for quite a while already. Um, but, um, bless you to the two people who were kind enough to ask me about pie. Um, what is your favorite pie recipe? So I, um, I don't have like a, a actual favorite recipe. I tend to be somebody who really likes fruit pies. So apple pie, peach pie, berry pie, I guess pumpkin would qualify, although technically that's a custard pie. Um, but yeah, I tend to be somebody who likes fruit pies and, um, I do have, I don't have a favorite pie recipe, but I have a favorite crust recipe. And that is from um, the book, um, it's called The Book on Pie by Erin Jean McDowell. And um, you can follow her on Instagram. I think it's E-M, is it E-J McDowell? I think, it, I think it's just E McDowell, but I'll put it in the um, description box. Um, she has, I'm not going to put the recipe here because it's hers to, uh, hers to give away, hers to have in the book. It's in the book if you want to get the book and it's an awesome book. It has tons of great stuff on pie. Um, really, really helpful, uh, directions, especially if you're a beginner. Um, beautiful, beautiful pictures, gorgeous pies, heartily recommend. Um, but if you follow her on Instagram, she does often like we'll do tutor, excuse me, we'll do tutorials. Um, and will has given away the pie recipe before. I'm sure you could actually probably even find it online if you search like Erin Jean McDowell pie recipe, uh, pie crust recipe. Um, and it's her instructions for doing it that are particularly helpful. Um, so yes, that is my, my favorite pie recipe is her crust. And then probably with some combination of like either peach or apple or berry, um, something like that. Um, and the last question in the video, last question about pies, last question for the video is, is there a place for savory pies in your heart or is it dessert pies all the way? Um, I had to think about this because I, I want to say that I'm equal opportunity pie person that I love every pie the same but it's just not it's just not true for me I think that my top in terms of pies would be the fruit pies in some kind of a, a traditional crust and then it would be custard pies in a traditional crust and then this is the hierarchy of pie for me and then it would be like cookie crust kind of pies like um, key lime, well actually no, key lime pie kind of breaks that rule because I do love key lime pie, but other cookie crusts like, you know, Oreo cookie crust with ice cream on the inside, something like that. Um, and then probably savory pies are at the bottom for me. So, um, yeah, I think they look really pretty. I want to say that I liked them, but I never actually look forward to eating one. If somebody, and, and if I'm going to make one, like if I'm going to go through the effort of making a crust and everything, I'm pretty much never going to decide to make a savory pie. And I know chicken pot pie, shepherd's pie, all of that. It's just not, they're just not my thing. So, um, yes, I guess, um, I guess there's not much of a place in my heart for savory pies. Uh, all right. On that note, um, thank you so much to everybody who sent in questions and to the many of you who sent in the questions about why it's taking so long to draw or why it's taking so long to get clients. Those answers are coming. You have dedicated videos coming. Um, the next two videos will be about those topics. So keep an eye out. Uh, and thank you to my patrons for, um, sponsoring this channel. If you appreciate what I make. If you appreciate these videos, if they've brought value to you, um, you can find the link to Patreon in the description box and I would so appreciate any support. Um, yeah. And I think that's it. I hope you all are having a great day, um, a great week, and I will see you soon. Bye.